Společnost Media Empire je největší producent CD a DVD nosičů pro váš osobní rozvoj a firemní růst. Kompletní nabídku naleznete na www.vzdělávacífilmy.cz Přejeme vám příjemný poslev. The middle class in America is getting crushed. The United States is becoming a third world nation. We're now at the most critical juncture in all of humanity. Well, this is the year and next year of the of the commercial crash. This is going to be the biggest wealth transfer in, in my lifetime. All the more reason to protect your assets. What they're always trying to do is predict and predict, and I think the word is preparation. Most people throughout the world are not financially educated. The Deflating. whole world is based on debt. You can count on the government destroying the dollar. You're really that worried about Goldman Sachs and, and Lehman Brothers? Yes. I'm afraid the Federal Reserve will eventually or come close to bailing them out. That's what I'm concerned about. And that young lady who says the taxpayer is not in trouble, who is going to pay for that bailout again as the taxpayer? That's where this whole thing started with playing games with your money. I think the biggest attitude to take is the opposite of what the papers do. Money does not start in your hands. Money actually starts in your head. And so what people have are these age-old, industrial age beliefs, you know, sacred cows such as go to school. Everybody says, yeah, you got to go to school, but you don't learn anything about money. Once I understood the game, then I could decide which way I wanted to play the game. So some of you who watch this program are going to say, well, that's not fair. Well, we're not trying to be fair. There is no fairness when it comes to money. Either you're a winner or you're a loser. That's all my job is, to inspire you to use this. Don't be a Pavlovian dog. I guess what a sacred cow is, if you define it, is something that uh, everyone kind of accepts as truth and it's taboo to say anything bad about it or go contrary. There's a lot of these things that I think are really serious. They hurt people. Why the sacred cows is because we have been taught things that really are number one don't apply today the uh, the thinking is obsolete and it's putting people back into dire financial consequences because they're following old outdated advice today's world's different than it used to be the way things always have been done aren't working and it's time that somebody stands up and shoots a few sacred cows so that people stop suffering we've got a lot of financial storms will they dissipate i don't i don't know but if they don't boy we need to be prepared don't we the whole world is based on debt it's trying to deflate and governments around the world are fighting the natural deflation tooth and nail. Debt! Debt is like a handgun. It can be either used to protect you or it can kill you if you use it the wrong way. The way I grew up, I had zero financial education because we had zero finances. Most of the people here are entrepreneurs. And what an entrepreneur does is an entrepreneur solves problems. And they see the problem. And the problem is only getting worse in terms of the whole financial crisis and what's happening to individuals. I mean, people are getting wiped out at later in life when they thought they could retire. It's so important who is surrounding you when you're hitting rock bottom. And you want to make sure that you have a backup plan. Many people want to change the government rather than change themselves. We have a solution. I, I feel we have a very strong solution. Hello, I'm Robert Kiyosaki, and I'm probably best known for my book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I'm Kim Kiyosaki. And today, you know, we're in a financial crisis, and we saw this coming. And that was the reason, back in 1996, we created the Rich Dad Company, was to provide financial education so people can learn to take care of themselves. If something isn't working for you financially today, then maybe you, gotta, you need to look for new answers. And we're always looking for new answers, and that's what this documentary is about. So it's about you getting financially educated and taking charge of your life and not depending on the government or other financial experts in depending upon yourself. So our answer to the financial crisis is to get financially educated. Financial education begins by shooting the sacred cows of money. Hello, I'm Robert Kiyosaki. I'd like to introduce you to my team. 
In actuality, the Rich Dad Company has thousands of people all over the world working with us or for us. But these people are the core of my team. They're friends, most are entrepreneurs, and they're my advisors. They've written the Rich Dad Advisors books. Most of us know what a soccer team looks like, or an American football team, or a baseball team. In business, successful people have great teams because business is a team sport. And one of the reasons so many people hurt financially is there are individuals playing against massive teams like big banks and things like this. So if you're going to be successful, you have to have a great team, great partners, great friends. The mission is to change people's lives through financial education. Because most of us are entrepreneurs. We run our own companies. And as you know, right now the world is in a massive financial crisis. And for many people, they woke up to the crisis around 2007 when the subprime mess hit. But in reality, this subprime mess or this global crisis, and it is a global crisis, has been brewing for years. And today, people are struggling, people are losing their homes, their jobs, their savings. Also, the rich are getting richer. So what this program is about is why people are struggling and what you can do personally to not be one of the victims of this crisis, because it is a global crisis. I'm out. You need to know the five elements of financial education. Element number one is history. There are many interesting dates, but in 1913, the Federal Reserve Bank was created. Also of importance in 1913, the Internal Revenue Service was created so they could tax us. You see, they had to tax us if they were going to print money. Date number two that's very important is in 1971. In 1971, President Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard. That is crucial because after 1971, money stopped being money. It started becoming a currency which was backed by debt. And one of the reasons we're in this massive financial crisis today is because after 1971, the Federal Reserve Bank could print as much money as it wanted. And in 1974, the rules of retirement changed. And that's why today, so many people of my generation are afraid of running out of money during retirement. And element number two is taxes. As you know, taxes are not fair. There are many reasons why the rich pay much less in taxes than the people who work for the rich. And element number three is having a financial vocabulary. In other words, understand the language of money. For example, what's the difference between an asset and a liability? Capital gains versus cash flow, or fundamentals versus technicals. That's all part of a financial vocabulary. Number four is wealth protection. As we all know, there's people out there trying to steal your money. But there's also people who you trust your money to who are also taking your money. So that's why part of financial education is not how much money you make, but how much money you keep. And element number five is always remember there's two sides to every coin. And that is to remind you that when you put your money in the bank, the bank gives it to somebody else. When you put your money in your retirement plan, the bank gives it to somebody else. So for a complete financial education, you need to know there's two sides of the coin. And in this program, you'll make a decision which side of the coin you want to be on. But one of the biggest secret calls of all is go to school. And many people think I'm anti-school. That is not true. I'm anti-ignorance. So I'm very pro-education. I'm just not pro being stupid about money. I think that's true, that what you said is education is more important now than it's ever been. That's right. So the problem is that the schools focus just on two kinds of education. There's the academic, which is really important. Reading, Reading writing, writing arithmetic. arithmetic, you need to have it, that's basic. Um, and the second type of education they give is the professional kind of education. So if you want to be a lawyer or an accountant or a teacher, then you need to go to school and get those certifications. But the one kind of education that's lacking severely in the school system as it stands is financial education. Time out. An important part of financial education is having a financial statement, which is an income statement and a balance sheet. 
Now, when you go to your banker, your banker always asks you for your financial statement, not your report card, because your financial statement is your report card once you leave school. Your financial statement will tell you whether or not you're smart with money or not smart with money, because that financial statement is your report card of your financial intelligence. I put on my Facebook one day that we need to teach our children financial education, and I received a comment back from a teacher that said, who's going to pay for it? <laughs> we're, we're all going to pay for it if we don't start educating our children in, in school. This is a very hot subject, but our schools are training people to be employees, to work for the rich. The second thing I don't like about school is how dare they label a kid as smart or stupid at an early age. The reason I'm sensitive to that <laughs> is because I was labeled stupid right off the start. <laughs> you know? oh. And it wasn't that I was stupid. I was bored and I was not interested and it was none of the subjects I wanted and nobody could tell me how I was going to use calculus. I kept asking my teacher, how am I going to use calculus? And they couldn't tell me. Are they training to be an employee or are they training to be street smarts? See, my, my poor dad was school smart, my rich dad was street smarts. And I'd rather be street smart today. Well, there, there's a total lack of practical education is really what you're talking about. And I found that. I, I'm an accountant. I, I have a master's degree. And you're an A student, right? And I'm an A student. We'll okay. forgive you. So, <laughs> thank you. But when, when I went to school, the only financial education I got was specific to my profession. Okay, there was no general financial education. I could have gone all through, gotten a master's degree, got a PhD in my field without any specific financial education about how to handle myself once I got out of school. Right, and people say to me, well, I learned economics in school. Is economics financial education? Not really. You know, it's not about investing, it's not about the laws, it's not about taxes, it's not about history. Well, anyway, also, Robert, as, you, as a lawyer, I see all sorts of people walk through the door. And some are highly educated, and some have no education at all, but like you said, they're street smart. And the first time I saw this type of client, I thought, wow, he's doing pretty well. He didn't go to college, but he's got all this real estate. And then there's a pattern to, that develops where you see a lot of people who never went to college, but are street smart and have done very well. I can just say, um, I was talking to a woman the other day, she's a high, just as you're saying, highly successful doctor very very successful medical, Ve doctor. medical doctor very smart in so many ways but when we were talking she finally looked at me and she said oh my god she goes I have not a clue about my money she's 45 years old not a clue and you think that because they're successful they know something about money but so many people don't because so many of us haven't had the, had the education school puts us in a culture of dependence we, we depend on three things. We depend on a corporation to take care of us, or we depend on government to take care of us. And the scary one, I think, is we depend on institutions, you know, our, the people we run our 401ks to take care of us. Stock market. And, and yeah, and we, we put ourselves, we, we rob ourselves of the independence to think, think freely as entrepreneurs or investors, and we just become dependent on those three entities. And it's brutal. And Mr. Maloney, you never, you never finished school, did you? Uh, no, no. I, I failed school, but more than that, school failed me. Uh, I was dyslexic. They didn't know what it was back then. But basically, I was just like you, uh, bored stiff. I got put in all the remedial classes. So I was in with the dumb kids, basically. They're, they weren't teaching me anything I wanted to learn or anything that I would ever use in my lifetime. And the reason I bring up Michael, he is the, I mean, most people agree he's probably the smartest guy on this team. And the problem was, again, was uh, Nita says there's three kinds of education. It's academic, reading, writing, arithmetic. That's professional, become a doctor, a lawyer, in my case, a pilot. And number three is financial. But Michael was put back because of academics, because you can't read, right? Right. So how did you learn how to read? Oh, well, Apple came out with uh, OS X uh, at the beginning of uh, the last decade. And uh, you can just select text and hit a button, and the computer reads to you. Most people don't know it's built into the operating system. But more, I developed a passion for global finance and economics, and monetary history, especially. And passion we, drives you. Now, now we can't shut them up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't blame Apple for that. <laughs> school is a solo game. I didn't do well in school. I did very well in sports. And in sports, you learn to compete. You learn to deal, deal with pressure, you teams, goals. And school is more so individually. I'm, I'm competing against everybody, and, and teamwork is cheating uh, in school. 
some of us cheese better than others. <laughs> and I'll just say last, last thing about school and money, which is a sacred cow. One of the things that really upsets me about schools and money is this. In America, schools are based upon real estate tax. In other words, if you come from a rich neighborhood, the real estate tax pays for better schools. If you're from a poor neighborhood, you get less money. So when anytime somebody tells me schooling is about being fair, that is, when I look at the number side of it, is if you're poor, you're getting the worst possible education. And to me, that is cruelty. So how does a person learn about money? How does a person increase their financial intelligence? This diagram called the cone of learning provides some interesting clues. The cone of learning was created by an educational researcher named Mr. Dale in 1969. And what he found is that the worst way to learn is by reading or listening to lecture. And the best way to learn is at the top, which is simulations or games, and then doing the real thing. The interesting thing is my poor dad, who was good at school, thought that reading and lecture was the best way to learn. My rich dad taught me to be a rich man at the top of a cone. He taught me using the game Monopoly. You know, four greenhouses, one red hotel. Four greenhouses, one red hotel. And then we went out and did the real thing. So one of the ways, if you want to learn without much risk, is by simulations, play games. The reason my wife and I created the cash flow game was so that you could play and play and learn physically, mentally, emotionally, but play, make a lot of mistakes with play money. So how many people in this room have made financial mistakes? <laughs> you know, the only thing we were ever taught was maybe how to balance a checkbook, how to have a savings account, those basics. Financial education is like learning another language. Yeah. You know, when you learn real estate, it's a different language than stocks. It's a different, different than entrepreneurship or commodities, or oil or gold. I say this all the time in Mexico. If you learn English, you can do business with the whole world. When you learn to speak the language of money, yeah. it opens up a whole new world. Yeah. And unfortunately, in our school systems, we don't teach the language of money. We teach people the language of becoming a doctor, a lawyer, or an employee. And the next sacred cow is get a job, or go to school and get a job. Now, the problem with getting a job is who do you think pays the most taxes? The owner of the business or the worker? To that, I'll turn to my accountant here, Tom. Well, it's, it's clearly the, the employee who's paying the most taxes. And, you know, I, I started as an employee right out of school, and I was paying high taxes. Even though my, my job is to reduce taxes, I was paying high taxes. And then I started, I know, ironic, isn't it? <laughs> and, then, and then about 15 years ago, I started my own uh, business. I, was, I started my own CPA firm, and I was now self-employed. And I was even paying more taxes. So it wasn't until I started acting like a bigger business and was really a, a significant size business that I started paying less taxes. And it's because it's the business owners and it's the, entre it's the entrepreneurs and it's the investors, the active investors, that really pay the least amount of taxes. Time out. During this program, you'll hear a lot about ESBNI, also known as a cash flow quadrant. E stands for employee. Employees have a job. S stands for self-employed small business or specialist, like a doctor or lawyer. These people own a job. B stands for big business, 500 employees or more, and these people have other people working for them. And I stands for an investor, and investors have their money work for them. Now my poor dad always said to me, go to school and get a job, and he wanted to be, become an employee or a specialist like a doctor or a lawyer. My rich dad said, if you want to be rich, you have to be on the business owner or the I side. And that's the difference between my rich dad and my poor dad. If you look at the uh, cash flow quadrant, you have the E, S, B, and I. The people that go to school are on the E and the S side. The S stands for specialists like a doctor or a lawyer, and E's are employees. But doctors and lawyers pay the highest taxes, right? Oh, by far. It's, it's those people that are self-employed because not only are they paying the highest income taxes, they also get the privilege of paying Social Security taxes and Medicare taxes on everything they earn. So th they're paying extra taxes just to be in that S quadrant. Right, so when you go to school, again, this academic and professional, you go to school and my mother wanted me to be a doctor, if I had followed in that footsteps, I'd be paying the highest tax possible. And they make, the, they make a lot of money, but they pay the highest percentage in taxes. So that's why this relates back to go to school. 
That's right. And, and they actually have the fewest options of reducing their taxes. The, the tax laws are really geared towards those people who are creating jobs. You know, and those are the entrepreneurs, those people who are uh, creating housing and, you know, building real estate because that's the government understands that's what we need. You know, we want the private sector to do that. And so we're rewarded for doing what the government wants us to do. And that's really all the tax law is. It's a, it's a system of rewards what the government wants you to do. Plus, you know, the other part of it, too, is this whole idea of getting a job. There was some kind of a myth out there that goes with get the job, get a safe, secure job. And so that by getting a job, somehow you're going to be taken care of for the rest of your life. And all you got to do is pick up any paper to see how many tens of thousands of people are losing their jobs. There are no safe, secure jobs. And now we're competing with India and Asia for jobs that were sacred to, to America at one point in time. So this whole idea of having a job is that was secure is probably the most insecure thing you could be doing right now. The idea of a secure job is an industrial age idea. Exactly. The only option that's put into your head is go get a job. And I wasn't it's around. Yeah, I wasn't around entrepreneurs. I wasn't around business owners growing up. I was around employees. When I um, first started my company 15 years ago, I, I went back to my class reunion, which is always an interesting thing. And I remember saying to them, "Yeah, you know, I, I started a company about five years ago." And they looked at me like, "Oh," and they, and some of them even said it. They go, "You're so brave." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, I've had this company for five years now. That is the longest I had ever worked anywhere. See, without financial education, you have to get a job. What's tragic today is so many people are losing their jobs. They go back to school to get another job, but they're now competing with their kids. You know, <laughs> uh, that's insanity. So we're not saying jobs are bad. We're just saying as entrepreneurs, our job is to create jobs. The government doesn't really create jobs. They need more entrepreneurs. I didn't even know there was another option growing up. I didn't know there was another option. I didn't know. I thought all you could do was get a job. So again, it's not right or wrong to be an employee, but I'd like to know what my what my options are. Right, because were you, when you were in school, did they say, uh, go to school, get your diploma so you can become an entrepreneur? No. I mean, you'll never hear that in the school system. Um, no, they said work your way up the ladder, oh. get the bigger paycheck, get, get a better to job, to get higher a better pay. Job. It, but you're right, job is the only option that you'll hear in school as a rule. And job stands for just over broke, you know? Well, <laughs> right. Right. To me, the real issue with the job is it's the highest risk profession you can have because you only have one client. Now, I, you know, when I started my business 15 years ago, it was after being fired from a job. And, and, what, and <laughs> what I recognized was that, you know, I had no control over my life because I had one client. That was my employer. Whereas now, now I have hundreds and thousands of clients. One client fires me. It's not the end of the world. You know, now my risk has gone down con considerably, almost to nothing. Where when, when you have a job, I mean, it's just a high risk play. Yeah, well, so the other thing is you're in complete control. That's the piece that I like. I like being able to, if I lose a client or- You're, I lose, an, you're an entrepreneur because nobody would hire you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm unemployable, there's no question. <laughs> But, the, the but it's nice, like, like you know, like if you're gonna lose some business or or you do lose some business, you can go out you and something. you can go out and generate business and 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 fill that gap. Financial security is more important than job security. Time out. E's and S's get punished for making mistakes, or they lose their job. B's and I's get richer from their mistakes because they learn from their mistakes. The next sacred cow is work hard. Because my poor dad, a school teacher, great guy, PhD, he always says, I'm a good, hard working man. And my rich dad had a different point of view, and he had me read this book by Mark Twain. It was a story of how, I think it was Huckleberry Finn or somebody got the other kids to paint the fence for him. He says, yep. he says that's working hard. You want other people to work hard for you, and you want your money to work hard for you. That was his lesson. And a lot of people really, you know, they can't wait till Friday because they hate their work so much, and they dread Sunday because they have to go back to work. With us, I would say most of us are working 24-7, but we're working differently. And I love my work. And it's challenging, there's problems and all that stuff, but I love it. So we work hard, but we don't work hard in the normal sense of working hard. The problem with working hard for money, because the rich don't work for money, the problem with working hard for money is you pay more in what, Dom? Taxes. Taxes. <laughs> The harder you work for money, the more you will pay in taxes, right? Well, right. If instead of working hard for 
for money, like you're talking about, instead if you work for assets, then you pay a lot less taxes because the, the, the tax law, again, is geared towards building assets because as we build assets, we build the economy. Time out. The big difference between E's and S's and B's and I's, E's and S's focus on the income statement and B's and I's focus on the asset column. My rich dad simply said to me, he says, assets put money in your pocket whether you work or not and liabilities take money from your pocket. For example, my house is a liability because it takes money from my pocket every single month. Yet my rental properties are assets because they put money in your pocket whether you work or not. One of the reasons so many people are struggling financially today is they're buying liabilities they think are assets. As we build assets, the economy grows and the employees get benefits also because now we have more jobs for more employees. But on Michael's side, why are people working so hard is because the Fed's also working hard printing money, right? Yeah, people, uh, I've got friends that just say I need to get more hours or I need to get a second job or something like that. They're working harder to make a few more dollars, but they don't realize that over this entire past decade, the average uh, in real income after inflation has been falling. So the harder people work, the less they're making anyway because the government and, and the Federal Reserve, the banking system, they're basically stealing it from them. Can we bring in the, the bags of coins right now? Thank you. I'm not gonna hold that. <laughs> oh, I'll give you an example. In the year 2000, one gold coin cost $300. So this is $300 in U.S. quarters. Today, in 2010, that same gold coin <laughs> it takes eleven $1 hundred dollars to buy the same coin. So the reason people have to work so hard to keep up, to keep paying money, is because the value of your dollars are going down. So the insanity of going to get another job, pay more taxes, and work harder, when the how much how many dollars did the Fed print in two thousand and nine? Uh, from August of two thousand eight uh, through. Uh, 2009, they created about one and a half times more paper dollars than it took 200 years, previous years, to print. So that's why people are working harder, because your money is worth less. And it isn't the coin that changed. People this don't understand that th it isn't this price going up, it's the value of the dollar falling. It's the currency that's changing. The can of soup in the grocery store, that can of Campbell's soup, it's the same can with the same contents from back in 1950 when it was 15 cents to today where it's a buck 95 or whatever it is. So that's why the rules have changed. In 1971, the US dollar stopped being money and it became a? It became a currency, it became debt. It became an IOU from the federal government. And the thing is, they can print as much as they like of it. And the more they print, the harder you have to work. It all takes place in your head. Take this glass here. In this case, the glass here is context. It holds the content, in this case, the water. E's and S's have a different context than B's and I's. Having a different context, E's and S's attract the sacred cows like go to school, work hard, you know, live below your means. B's and I's having a different context entirely attracts a different type of content, different type of information, different type of education. Money is created out of your head. If you're a true B and I, you're not concerned, it's because just like the Fed, we can print our own money. And now for our next sacred cow, one of our favorite ones, live below your means. <laughs> How many of you here do not like living below your means? No, 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 no. That's no fun. It kills people's spirits. Now, why would you want to live below your means? But many people have to, unfortunately, because the Fed is printing so much money that taxes and inflation go up, which means people are forced to live below their means. So anybody have any comments on living below your means? Well, if you're on a paycheck, um, you have that one income coming in, and if you're just one person, you've only got 24 hours in a day to work. So there is a limit to how much you can work to get those paychecks coming in. So in that situation, you are forced to live below your means. Well, and the key here is to, is to raise your means. 
I mean, that, that's the idea. It's, it's not that we want to, you know, be in terrible credit card debt or something like that. Instead, let's raise our means and so that we can live the way we want to live instead of living at this poverty level. So why is it that whenever somebody looks at, uh, some advisor looks at your, if you want to handle your finances, the first thing they look at is how do you cut expenses? So what does a financial planner tell you? The first thing that they ask you is, what do you need to live on when you retire? They never ask you what do you want. Time out. Robert and I definitely do not believe in living below our means. When we met in 1984, we had nothing. But every year we would get together at New Year's and we would set our goals, you know, health goals and this goals. But we also had asset goals. You know, what goals were we going to add every single year? So that's why it took us only about 10 years from 1984 to 1994 to become financially free. Because we just kept adding assets every year. And we continue to do the same thing today, you know, simply because it's fun. It's exciting. That's it one is. Of, one of the best kept secrets. <laughs> Getting rich is fun. It is fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of fun. And you know, if we want to buy a luxury, if we want to buy a new car, we first buy an asset. So we buy the asset and the cash flow from the asset pays for the payment for the car. Yes. So that it's, it's again, never living below your means. It's expanding your means through acquiring assets that give you cash flow that gives us all those good things in life. The point here is this, there's assets and liabilities. The way you increase your means is acquire more assets, not houses, not cars, but assets. So the reason so many people struggle financially is they have no financial education. They may be a good doctor, a lawyer, or accountant, or a rock star, but if they don't know the difference between assets and liabilities, and they keep buying liabilities instead of assets, they have to keep living below their means. And not even if you're single or not, if you're on a fixed income, if you're an E and an S, your income is limited. Look, there's four major expenses that keep E's and S's poor. Number one is tax, and taxes are gonna go up because the Fed is printing so much money all over the world. Two is debt. People leave college with tons of debt, credit card debt to make ends meet, and then their house because they think it's an asset. Three is inflation. Inflation goes up because as taxes go up and prices go up, then inflation goes up. And fourth is retirement. You must put something away for the day you stop working. So those are the four main reasons E's and S's, as a general rule, have to live below their means. But if you have financial education and live on the B and the I side, you can increase your means by increasing assets. I think a lot of people accept mediocrity mm -hmm. and in order to be able to grow in business, in order to make more money, you have to step out of that comfort zone and stop being mediocre. Or hoping the government's gonna save you. Yeah. I think live below your means is one of the greatest spirit killers there is. There's a lot of people who like being poor. I'm not making it right or wrong. But that's definitely not what I like to do, and Kim and I, we definitely I don't live below our means. <laughs> no, I definitely do not like living below my means. I've done it when I was in college, you know, and that's because that was exciting times and all. But I get inspired when I have to create, when I get put into a position where I need to create something new, not contract. I want to be bigger than I am, not less than I am. And I think people are being taught to be less than they are instead of inspiring people to be more than you are. Well, and, and that's the issue with the idea of, this, of a budget, right? A budget is all about cutting. It's all about slicing. It's all about being less than you are. Whereas if instead you were looking at something like a strategy or you're looking at, at projections as to, into the future, what can I do as opposed to what can't I do? I, to me, that's the big distinction. Well, and a lot of it comes from fear too. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people are afraid of their futures. They're not sure where the futures are gonna, are gonna lead them. So they think, well, I'll live below my means. I'll, I'll save, I won't allow myself to have this small luxury, that small luxury. And then, of course, you know, they fall off the wagon. Well, the worst go, thing is... And then they feel bad about it. Yeah, so the worst it thing is guilt. they cut back on their expenses and mm -hmm. they save money. Right, Mike? That's the worst thing they could do. Right. Depreciating money. It, it all goes back to the questions you ask. I mean, when you say, I can't afford it, I don't have the money for that, you know, a better question would be, how can I afford it? How, how can, can I, I get the money for that? Expands your mind. And you know, in my community where I grew up, living below your means was pretty much a step up. <laughs> Being honest. We didn't have any means and we didn't live and we didn't know how to live. It was basically survival. And some of the ways we created those means were, of course, by legal definition, illegal. But you know, that was the way we survived and that was the way we got by. So now living below your means is something that is completely opposite to abundant living, which is what I believe in my faith is abundant living. The opposite of that, to me, is it's not the way that God intended for us to live. 
So that's why I think it's absolutely criminal our school system does not teach us much about money. And what they do teach us, they tell you, put your money in the bank, which means you lose more money, and they talk to a financial planner who put you in mutual funds. That is not financial education. That is educating people to give more money to the rich. That will also cause you to have to live below your means. Yes. That's right. That's what they're training you to do. Yeah, well, and, while budget. and while you're at it, you're going to be paying more and more taxes because you get no tax benefit for living below your means. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the problem is they say to a child, go to school and get a job or become a doctor and lawyer. You will pay more than your fair share of taxes and then you too will have to live below your means. If you're playing defense instead of offense, yeah. you're just hiding and, and trying to play it safe and, and, and saving money and, and you never manifest. You cannot be who you're supposed to be. I say it's time to get financially educated and take care of yourself. And now we're going to the sacred cow of save money. And in 1971, President Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard basically took the world off the gold standard and money was no longer money so people are no longer saving money so just to re reiterate again this is three hundred dollars what an ounce of gold was worth in the year 2000 so Kim lift that okay all right and so this here is one ounce of gold in the year 2010 and it's now eleven hundred dollars and this is why people are working so hard <laughs> I can do it. I can Careful. do it. Careful. Yes, I can do it. Barely. So the big reason <laughs> I've said in my books for years that savers were losers is very simply because in 1971, the dollar stopped being money. It became debt. Right, Mike? Yeah, it, the rules are all changed in 71. Uh, before then, uh, somebody, when they were, like, became working age, they could expect to put away 10% a year, and by the time they got into their 60s, they could retire on their savings account and, and expect to live off that interest. And uh, in 71, everything changed, and they started uh, creating currency on a massive scale worldwide. ever since then, worldwide. And that is what causes inflation and the loss of purchasing power. So people thinking that they can retire, you know, back in the 50s, if you got $100,000 or $50,000, you could retire on that. Yeah. Yeah. So for my mom and dad, you know, the World War II generation, the industrial age generation, it was very smart to save money. For our generation, the baby boom generation and on, saving money could be the most stupid thing you can do because the system is stealing your wealth through the very thing you work for called money, which is not money anymore. Right. And Real money is, is actually gold and silver. Money has to uh, maintain its value over long periods of time. Uh, currency doesn't have to. And this, this is, is historically, as always, but for thousands of years, this yeah. has been money. 5,000 years, this has been the predominant currency. It became money when somebody minted it to, into coins in Lydia in about 680 BC. And uh, each unit had the same buying power as the next one. It became interchangeable. So let me ask you this. This printing of money out of just paper, this has been tried before, hasn't it? <laughs> many, many, many times, and there's always one result. You get far, far higher uh, prices of everything, but especially real money, when they start creating a whole lot of currency. Eventually, gold and silver lie in wait. And then when the public senses this inflation that of, of retail prices that is caused by inflation of the amount of the quantity of currency in circulation, they rush back toward gold and silver, so, and they have for 5,000 years. So what's, name purchasing. some governments that have attempted to print money. Uh, the Weimar Republic. Which I don't know Germany. what I just, just did with that $100 trillion the dollar bill. He's got a the Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, yeah. Look at this one. This is the most recent, a $100 trillion dollar note. You know, this is the largest uh, note ever printed, and $100 was, trillion. And this was printed in 2000. Yeah, but when Zimbabwe was created as a country when it went from Rhodesia to Zimbabwe, they were, uh, the, the Zimbabwean dollar was uh, on parity with the U.S. dollar. One U.S. dollar was the same as a Zimbabwe dollar. This doesn't buy anything today. It doesn't what buy a cup buy? of coffee. What, doesn't even buy a cup of coffee? No. In fact, uh, they have ruined it by putting ink on it. You can't write a, <laughs> you can't even use it you can't write a list, so there, it, it would have been more valuable at this point if it was blank. Right. 
So the Greeks did the same thing when they started clipping coins, they just take the silver off of it. The Romans tried it, the English tried it, the Germans tried it, the Chinese tried it, and now the U.S. is trying it. Yep. And so that's why saving money is probably the biggest mistake you could make right now, because today money is no longer money. It's can, now debt. I can vouch for that because my leg is now numb. <laughs> <laughs> So all currencies throughout the world are in trouble, the same way this Zimbabwe dollar is in trouble. And that's the problem with saving money. After 1971, it was no longer money. Said of all the currency on the planet is U.S. dollars. If the U.S. dollar goes, the world goes with it. I'm preparing by getting fully diversified. I buy both gold and silver. <laughs> <laughs>It's no secret that the California housing bubble has popped with hardships spread wide. Real estate expert Robert Kiyosaki predicted all of this would happen back in 2005, but most people didn't listen. It's the biggest financial bubble in the history of the world, so I have the benefit of traveling the entire world. All markets go up, all markets come down, so the market will come back. But right now, it's going to be a sled ride down. It might be a down for a long time, simply because it's going to take more of a down payment because nobody trusts anybody anymore. And the next big sacred cow is your home is an asset. See, in 1997, I wrote in Rich Dad Poor Dad, your house is not an asset. And at that point, every realtor stopped sending me Christmas cards. <laughs> <laughs> because your home is not your asset. Your home is actually your bank's asset if you could read a financial statement. So, Kenny, you own lots of real estate. Yes. Is your home an asset? No, not my personal residence. A lot of people are in trouble today. Yeah, yeah, house... it doesn't produce any revenue. It's, it's, right. You know, I, I pay the bank every month. It, it's the bank's asset. Yeah, and what everybody has to tell me, I want, my house has appreciated in value. Again, that's capital gains versus cash flow. And what the people are finding out now that the real estate market has crashed, and this is all over the world, the value of their home has been sucked out. And so now that somehow people are upside down because they're really finding out it's a liability because they still have to pay the bank on that mortgage. You know, so let's say they bought a house for 200,000, they still owe 180,000, but the house is only worth 100,000 now. And they're now finding out that your house is not an asset, it's a liability. And I'll tell you, I'm the largest originator of FHA and VA loans in the entire country out of everybody. I rent. What does that tell you? <laughs> <laughs> but as an account, is a house an asset? Oh, well, no, you know, the bank considers it. You know, they'll say it's an asset, and the financial planners will say it, it's an asset. But the reality is, it, it's not an asset unless it's putting money in your pocket. And a house just drains money from your pocket. And, and the thing that I, one of the, my little pet peeves is that people say, well, if you own a house, though, you get a deduction yeah, for the interest. Correct. Yes, but it's money out of your pocket. And the best you can get is 40 cents on the dollar. Okay, so you're given a dollar and you get 40 cents back. You're still out 60 cents. It's not difficult math. Your home is shelter. It's a place to raise a family. But it's not an asset that you're ever going to make money it's, it's on. It's not a financial asset. No, you might make money in an uptrending market, but today the market's trending down. And that's why in 1997, what I said in Rich Dad Poor Dad, your house is not an asset, was heresy. Now people are going, oh my God, I should have listened to him. So I'm not saying don't buy a house. I'm saying just don't be financially ignorant and call your house an asset if it's taking money out of your pocket. Because Kim and I own two houses, one here in Arizona and one beautiful beach house in Hawaii, and they're our biggest liabilities. People did think, especially in the high times, you know, in the, in the, when the markets were high, they did think their house was an asset. And people, even if they had their mortgage paid off, they were borrowing against their house and putting it into the stock market or wherever they were putting it. So not only were they getting crazy mortgages, but they were taking money out against their house in second, third mortgages. Well, and, and they were doing it for things like vacations ah, and yes. boats, <laughs> boats and cars and other things like this. And, and the reality is the reason they were doing that is because they got to deduct the interest off their taxes. Ooh. And so they thought that, well, this is okay because I get a deduction. But uh, just yeah. because you get a deduction doesn't make it a good thing to do. Well, yeah, one of the trouble. big mistakes people make is over-improving their house. <laughs> you know, they put in a $50,000 swimming pool and it brings them $20,000 worth of value. Well, the way I look at it is you just bought a $30,000 babysitter. 50% of the mortgages in Reno are underwater, meaning that the mortgage is greater than the value of the property. All right, and this affects the whole community because people aren't able to sell their homes and move to a place where they can get a better job. The neighbors aren't going to sell their house because values are so far down. 
So this has affected entire communities. And again, we've, we've heard people say that your home is an asset. Well, we're talking here about financial education, and this is one of the biggest financial lessons that our country has had to learn, a very hard way, that your home is not an asset. This has happened before, and what's gonna happen is new laws will come in, new credit will be loosened again here years from now, and the prices will come up again, and people will do it again. It's about a 20-year cycle as in anything. The point here is this. This is the best time to be buying real estate. If you are a first-time home buyer, this is your best time. Just don't call it an asset. You know, this is the best time to getting back in the market. And that's why it takes financial education. The reason I'm in real estate is for one reason. It's debt. It is one of the easiest assets to get debt on is real estate. But if you're going to use debt, you've got to be highly financial and intelligent. Otherwise, if you're not intelligent, just keep calling your house an asset. We're talking a lot about assets. And there are four primary asset classes. One is business. As an entrepreneur, you own a business. Number two is real estate. And we love rental properties that cash flow, real estate that puts money in our pocket every single month. Number three are paper assets, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, savings. Most E's and S's are in paper assets today. And number four are commodities, gold, silver, precious metals, oil and gas. For Robert and I, we're in business. We're in real estate. We own hundreds of properties in real estate. We have paper assets and we have commodities. So for us, when we talk about diversification, we're in all four asset classes. Now we're gonna shoot one of the more evil of all the sacred cows. Evil for most people. Get out of debt. And a lot of people are saying, cut up your credit cards. I think that's really ridiculous because a credit card is not the problem. In fact, I love my credit cards. I don't know how anybody could get along today without a credit card. But the credit card isn't the problem. It's lack of financial education is the problem. The entire currency supply, all of the dollars in existence, require debt. You can't have a dollar without debt. A dollar is just an IOU. It's borrowed into existence either by the government creating a bond which promises to pay interest, uh, you know, you've got to pay out of future taxes, uh, or people uh, create currency by taking out a loan at the bank, fractional reserve lending. Every month there's a payment due on those dollars that you created. Right, and this credit card is a fast way of creating money because there's really no money in this card. See, let's say I go to the store, there's no money in it, and I, I charge $100. Like magic, $100 is created and it flows into the economy. That's why debt is good. But when you abuse this, that's when we get in trouble. So I think, you know, Mr. Rodney here, you see the horror stories of bad debt, don't you? Yeah, I have see people walk into my office that make $150,000 a year, but they have $250,000 in credit card debt. You know, let's face it, we live in a credit society and you do have to have credit. And we have to learn how to survive and thrive in, this, in our credit economy that we are. But you know, people are walking in and they have this bad debt. They're asking, what do we do with it? Well, number one, you try to pay off the bad debt so you can invest in good debt, which would be real estate. And we love debt, don't we? Yeah, we have a lot of debt. <laughs> our real estate that, that we own is all basically financed with, with our tenant. So that's what I consider to be good debt. So when, when we get real estate, uh, you know, we, we get uh, proper leverage and it's paid by all the residents that live in all of our projects. Well, and, and it's not just real estate. Business is the same way. I mean, we have good debt in business as well, so that the business is paying. We have debt in our business, but that's how we grow, and it's the cash flow from the business that's able to pay the debt, and the debt creates more cash flow. Time out. Capital gains versus cash flow. See, in my opinion, 90% of the people invest for capital gains. That's why they say, well, my stock price went up or my house went up in value. That's capital gains. People like myself understand cash flow. In other words, I want a steady paycheck every single month. For example, my apartment house, every month it puts cash flow in my pocket. So if you want to be rich, you have to know this between capital gains and cash flow. Capital gains is technically gambling. You're hoping something will change. Cash flow is more guaranteed. I want that income every month. So very intelligent investors invest for both capital gains and cash flow. People say, I like real estate. I don't really like real estate. I just love debt. Because it's so easy to get a loan 
on real estate, right? Well, here, I like the analogy that you use sometimes. Say, if you put a million dollars of, of cash into a mutual fund, you get whatever you get paid. But if you put a million dollars of it in, uh, in a down payment, uh, you know, for, uh, for some kind of a commercial project like we have, you actually buy a $5 million project. Right. So, so you're actually getting a five million dollar asset with a million dollars versus a million dollars of mutual funds, and so you you know the the value you're creating on that real estate is 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 on the five million, not the one million. Well, you, the, by using and, banks leverage and the tax benefits that you get on the real estate isn't on the one million either. It's on the five million. So, so you you not only increase leverage on your cash flow and on on your growth in your asset, but you also increase your leverage on your taxes. Well, here's what and here's what we're doing. You know, we get these loans, the tenants are paying them off. That's the point. You know, you know like, so, so, you know, oftentimes people don't look at that. And they're paying it off with after-tax dollars. Yeah, they're moving into our places, they're paying our rent, we're taking that rent, and we're paying our mortgages, and our mortgages are getting paid down to zero. Wait a minute. Ken's talking about these million-dollar deals. Let me tell you how I started. I'm somebody that knew absolutely nothing about money or financing or investing, and I began investing with a little two-bedroom, one-bath house, and this was back in 1989. The house cost me $45,000. I had to put down $5,000, of which I didn't have, and I had a mortgage or good debt of $40,000. And the reason it was good debt is because every month I would collect the rent, I would pay the expenses, I would pay my mortgage payment, and at the end of the month, I had a positive cash flow of $25. Now, it wasn't a lot, but it was a start. And from there, I learned, and I did my next investment and my next investment. So it was good debt, because that debt put money in my pocket every single month. Just if people understood that there is such a thing as good debt, because I don't know how many people I talked to, but when I say, when I talk about debt, Oh man, debt is the dirtiest word in the world. That's the that's the four letter word. Debt. Because, and, because and, they're not educated. No, that's why. And and people are raised, and I was raised to get out of debt. You see, that this is the thing. You go to a bank, and the banker will sell you mutual funds. But ask them if they will loan you money to buy those mutual funds. The answer is no. But if we go in and we say we want to buy real estate, oh, well, how much do you want? It's because there's collateral. Yeah. They actually have something physical. That's it. Yeah, they'll sell you they'll sell you mutual funds, but they won't lend you money on mutual funds. That should tell you something. That should be a quick indicator. Dear God, what are you trying to tell me? You know, and the other part about it is too, is that that borrowed money for real estate, is that after tax, pre-tax, or no tax? Well, it's no tax. A anytime you're borrowing money, there, there's no tax on that money. You can use that cash. It's not, it's not taxable at all. So if somebody wants to borrow a million dollars or save a million dollars, it'll probably take them two million dollars to save the million because tax is going to take 50% of it. Right. But I just go straight in and borrow a million dollars, which they give us. It's great money. I love my banker. I'm not saying bankers are bad. They're fabulous because they give us the money. All they want is their interest. We keep all the appreciation, uh, depreciation. Uh, amortization, we, we keep all of it. They're the best partners of all. So I'm not anti-bank and I'm not anti-debt. I'm anti-lack of financial education because there's good debt and there's bad debt. Your rich dad was a tough, tough, tough mentor. But you know, I think some of the greatest mentors are tough because a really great mentor will push you to go beyond where you think you can go. And that's some of my best mentors. That's what they've done for me. Yeah, and I didn't always listen to my rich dad. I still remember I did the real estate course, you know, and I went running out in Honolulu and I found this condo and it was for $64,000 and it didn't cash flow. So I went to see my rich dad and he said, I said, but it's gonna go up in value. In other words, capital gains. He says, never buy anything that goes up. It must cash flow. And I said, no, 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 it's gonna go up. And we argued and argued and argued. And this is what he said to me. He says, he says, if you start investing for capital gains, someday you will lose big time. So that I let that apartment, I let that condo go. I didn't pay sixty-four thousand. Today it's probably worth three hundred thousand, but I learned the lesson from my coach, my rich dad. If I had gotten into the habit of buying for capital gains, either the price of stocks going up or real estate going up, I might have been wiped out in this crisis. So that's why a coach and a mentor keeps you onto your plan. And helps you create and develop very, very good financial habits. Because right. if you have poor financial habits as you're in, in your personal life, you're gonna take those into your investment life. So one of the most important things is they will help you develop great financial habits.
because when markets go up, greed sets in and greed makes people stupid. <laughs> After 1974, the rules of retirement changed and suddenly it forced E's and S's into the I quadrant with no financial education and they started to put their money into these retirement plans and suddenly, voila, a whole new industry was born called financial planners. And today, it takes 30 days to become a financial planner. It still takes a year and a half to become a massage therapist. It, you know what I mean? And so what do you think of mutual funds? I think they're a great way to make money if you sell them to other people. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're, I think it's one of the worst uh, places a person could put money. They really do. They make other people rich. You know, hidden fees, expense ratios, and you talk about the law of, of compound interest. Well, there's the law of compound expenses. Okay, so let me ask you this. If I say to you, invest for the long term, you know what I mean, for 30, 40 years, what do you think about that in, in, the, in a paper asset? You've I mean, lost the, control that quick. Liquidity is what paper assets are about. Your ability to sell and buy without negotiation and problems. And so the moment you say, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to hold Enron, and I'm going to hold WorldCom, and I'm going to hold, you know, GM, and I'm going to hold United <laughs> Airlines. And, well, you can just go on and on. I'm Pan Am. <laughs> but the moment you decide to hold that, what control do you have? Not, you know, you, yeah, in real estate, you can force the appreciation, paint it, carpet. You can't do it with paper. Well, Your only way. control is to sell. If you hold it forever, you're, you're rolling the dice and saying, I hope it works out. Right. There's a lot of people say, you know, stocks are the best way to go and don't get into real estate. You know, there's a lot of these financial advisors. But the stocks are good for people who are not business people. You see, as entrepreneurs and real estate people, when you look at a financial statement, I personally am responsible for income, expenses, assets, liabilities. But as an investor, even in Microsoft, I have no control over income, expense, assets, and liabilities. All correct? you can do is sell or hedge. That's all you can do. Well, that's, that's right. And what, what makes it worse is that you take those you take those paper assets that you don't have control over because you invest in the long term and then you put them into our 401k so you have even less control because once they're in that 401k you can't take them out you you, you really can't do anything with them you're penalized for early early withdrawal you're, you're, you're penalized for pulling them out and then on top of that you don't even get the the one tax benefit you get with paper assets is capital gains and you put it into a 401k you've lost that benefit on top of that when you pull it out there's three types of taxes, earned income, portfolio income, and capital gains or passive income. And savings and mutual funds, what are they taxed at? Well, when you, when you pull them out, when it's going through a 401k, they're all taxed at the highest ordinary income rate. It's the worst thing you could possibly do if you plan to be rich, but if you plan to be poor, it's a pretty good plan. Robert, I've seen you take heat in the press by this, where you oh. say they're risky. And, and I'll tell you where I think the risk is. When you sit down and they say, we're going to diversify you. You know, that way if, if one company goes down, you got all these other companies to buoy you up. And, and that's fine for a non-systematic type thing, but, but a, a system-wide problem, it does not protect us if the system breaks down. Because and I it's think not it's, diversification. Yeah, it's more fragile now than I think it ever has before. And I think these people saying, well, I'm well diversified. They're not well diversified. You diversify across asset classes not just in, in bunches of stocks, in my opinion anyway. So the problem here with diversification it doesn't protect you from a crash. Right. And it's not diversification anyway, and Buffett does not, Warren Buffett, the world's greatest investor, reportedly, says diversification is something like it's protection from ignorance. Right. But it's ignorance from both the person selling you the plan as well as you who invest in the plan. But this is the biggest thing that really bugs me. When Kenny and I buy real estate, we always buy insurance, don't we? Yeah. yeah. And then when we drive a car, we have insurance. Right. right. Is there insurance for mutual funds? Well, not for the average person. No. I mean, is there, things, is yeah. there insurance on your 401k that what you put in will be there when you retire? And which is more likely to burn down in the next five years, your home <laughs> <laughs> or your, or your 401k? Your 401k. Yeah. And I'll say it again. We all drive cars with insurance, hopefully. We have houses with insurance. When we buy real estate, we have insurance. Our companies have insurance. But the 401k, all these retirement plans, there's no insurance on them. So if it crashes, they lose everything, and the mutual fund companies walk away with the money. And that's a higher level of education, because most people don't know how to hedge that. Nope. They don't know how. I mean, it's possible, but if you but interview you the teach. average person. Yeah, that's what we teach. That's what, that's what our advanced courses teach, is how to play But the average game. person, I, yeah. I liked what your comment said. If you poll the average person, you say, tell me the difference. This is a very basic question. 
What is the difference between a defined benefit pension plan and a contribution plan? Most of the people I talk to do not know that difference, and that is not, that is not a minor thing. That is a That's major deal. Time out. This is a very important point. See, in 1974, the rules of retirement change. Prior to 1974, most people, like my parents, had a defined benefit pension plan. What that meant was that they received a paycheck for life. After 1974, the entire world started on to defined contribution pension plan. What you put in is all you get back. And that's why these defined contribution plans, so many people are terrified of running out of money in retirement, simply because with a defined contribution plan, you can lose everything in the market crash, or you can run out of money before you die. The cool part about this whole discussion is those people putting the money in the pension plans and mutual funds, that's the money I get <laughs> to buy my That's real right. estate. It's the truth. No, that, that, so the that, money, that the money flows for the E's and S's, flows for the, the B's and I's. S's to the B's and the I's, and then I make money on their money. So Kim and I just bought this huge property, five golf courses and a major resort, and most of the money came from retirement plans. So I keep putting that money in that 401k, <laughs> you guys, because it has to go somewhere. Cash always flows, and it flows from the E's and S's to the B's and I's. And that's why financial education is so crucial. Anytime you have no control over your money or your return of your money, you're gambling. So in closing, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, watching and paying attention to this. And I'd also like to thank my friends here because as you've heard so many times that one of your greatest assets or your liabilities are the people you hang around with. But there's one more thing about friends. So I want to thank you guys for being givers. For everybody, what, what I would leave you with is take control of your life. It's not too late. And in fact, if you're, you're in a difficult situation, now's a better time than ever to make a change. And you can make that change. We've all made this change. Every one of us has been there. We've all been in the dumps and we've all hit at, at the top. And we know that we can do it. We know that you can do it. So take control. You can't wait until you have 100% confidence because you never have 100% confidence. You know, you, you do have to take the leap. It's not until you hit a point where things become so uncomfortable or so painful that you are willing to accept that things aren't working, right? The way that you think they're, they're supposed to work. And so for many people, when they get into a financial crisis, it, that's, that's their wake up call and that's where the change starts. I mean, help your children today. Take control of their financial education because they're, they may not receive it in school, but there are experts out there. And I want to say specifically to the women who are watching, you know, this is your time and be strong. Get that financial education. As we said, knowledge is the new money. And for women, I think this is really an opportunity for you to grow and get stronger. So I encourage you all to just take that next step. And if the objective is, like Robert says, to turn your mind into an asset instead of a liability, uh, is, it, it takes more than one book. It takes more than watching one video. It's a whole process. I mean, there's no professional, there's no athlete, no uh, expert in any area that has become a professional at something in one week or with one book or with one DVD or one workshop. To further your financial education, the Rich Dad Company has advanced educational programs and these programs are in the business entrepreneurial sector, in real estate, and in paper assets. We also have Rich Dad coaching and mentorship programs in business, real estate, and paper. These programs are developed to get you from where you are today to where you want to be. You know, the coaching was a really good start for us. It, it really helped us find what we wanted to do. It helped us find our niche in the market. I suggest uh, a Rich Dad mentor because you're learning from the best. Uh, my mentor, she walked me through everything as far as my first deal. Um, and after I built up from that first deal, I was able to go out and seal a few more deals after that. And, and each time, I, I learned from the mistakes that I made the previous one. And I gained the confidence that I needed. It is imperative that you uh, get role models in the form of coaches, 
and trainers uh, every step of the way. Uh, they're going to keep you on track. You know, you've got to go through a minefield of failure to get over onto the side of success where you want to be. Well, I am a personal trainer, and I can tell you from my own experiences that trying to do something that you know nothing about without someone to guide you, you're going to waste a lot of time. See, my rich dad was my mentor, but he was also my coach. He was also my cheerleader. He was also the meanest SOB I ever met in my life. But that's why I got far. So today, it's a habit to have a coach because professionals have coaches. That's right. And amateurs, they got themselves. And it's much easier to follow in somebody else's footsteps than it is to reinvent the wheel. And uh, if you want to make it a long and painful journey, do it all by yourself. You're going to get your education one way or the other. And if you don't get it now, you're going to get it later and you'll probably spend, end up spending a lot more money in the long run than uh, doing it right the first time. Education is a process. For example, I entered Navy Flight School in Pensacola, Florida, and two years later, I popped out as a Marine helicopter gunship pilot on my way to Vietnam. That educational process transitioned me from a guy who couldn't fly to somebody who became one of the best pilots in the world. The same thing with education. When you go to school, the question is, what do you come out as? When you go through the process of education, do you come out an employee? Do you come out a person who needs a paycheck? Do you come out a person always looking for a job? You know, person working hard and paying excessive taxes. So most people go to school and they pop out E's and S's. To come out as a B and an I, you need financial education because financial education is also a process. So finally, one of the ways we learn best is by repetition. For example, I didn't learn to fly flying once. I hit flying and flying got better and better. So one of the reasons we created this DVD or this program for you is even if you didn't understand everything, you know, see it again. You know, wait a week, look at it, and more will absorb to you. Wait another week, watch it again, and more and more will make sense. shift your context you have to put in the content and you're gonna make up your mind today or you're gonna say I'm gonna do it tomorrow so that's why I talk about rich dad's education and all that stuff because I want you to make your changes if you don't you can see what's gonna happen great words about quitting from a great man one of the greatest leaders of all in the past hundred years is Winston Churchill in the darkest hour of England he said never give up never give up never 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 thank you for watching this Thank you guys. Let's out of We're out of here. Thank you. Společnost Media Empire je největší producent CD a DVD nosičů pro váš osobní rozvoj a firemní růst. Kompletní nabídku naleznete na www.vzdělávacífilmy.cz Přejeme vám příjemný poslech.